again with another episode of Occupy Interview with uh, our host, Terry Bain, Mark Lahr, our staff, uh, Brattery, Memphis Pyle, and uh, Katie Droxel, Tara, everybody else out there. Uh, thank you for uh, helping us get the show going. Our guest today is going to be uh, Dr. John P. McCormick, Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. Uh, Terry, you want to start us off? Sure thing. Thanks, James. Dr. McCormick, how are you doing? Can you say hello for us? I'm doing very well, Terry. Thanks for having me on today. Oh, thanks for being here. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Um, I heard you interviewed, and, and uh, it really came as a surprise to me that I had forgotten uh, that, that Machiavelli uh, was actually a strong proponent of representative democracy. Uh, how did he get such a bad rap? Can you kind of give us a, a, a little background on that? Well, sure. Uh, he mostly has a bad rap because he wrote what he called was a little book called The Prince, um, which recommends uh, a lot of um, actions on the, on the part of princes and political actors that uh, people normally consider uh, reprehensible or wrong. But um, people, don't, people don't realize that uh, Machiavelli, he may have said the ends justify the means, but... Uh, things are more sophisticated than that. He had very specific ends. Uh, he preferred, for instance, not only republics to principalities, he preferred democratic republics to aristocratic republics. And most of the means that he advises that uh, political actors use are intended to further or bring into being democratic republics. I, I love the quote. Uh, I had my old <laughs> college textbook, uh, Max Lerner, uh, had a quote there from Voltaire to Frederick the Great, uh, quote, if Machiavelli had had a prince for disciple, the first thing he would have recommended him to do would to have been to write a book against Machiavellism. <laughs> uh, Which is what I, Frederick the Great actually did, right? Uh, it, it, it's amazing all of the, the figures throughout history who are reacting to what Machiavelli was writing uh, can you give us kind of a sense of just how strong in Western civilization this guy's thinking is? Well, here, here's the thing. I mean, The Prince is a book that's we have to remember is dedicated to a prince, right? So it's dedicated to Lorenzo de' Medici, and it's an advice book. Uh, and in that book, one of the things Machiavelli advises is that one of the things a prince must do to be successful is to manipulate the people. But people overlook the fact that the book itself is a manipulation of the prince to actually benefit the people. So Machiavelli's, yes, he tells the prince to do all kinds of things and to appear to be good, to appear to be pious, to appear to be just. But his practical advice in the book, if you could name two practical uh, ends or, or means that a prince should use to maintain power, those are arm the people, arm the common people, and suppress the nobles. In other words, give the people weapons to hold you accountable to them. Um, and, and then if we bring this to his other book, as, as you were mentioning before, the, the Discourses, the Discourses on Livy, his book on republics, it shows that somebody like Romulus, a great prince like the Roman uh, founder Romulus, who actually armed the people and then confined the nobles or the wealthy or the aristocrats in a Senate, actually set in motion uh, the development of a very vibrant, free, civic, uh, civically equal democratic republic. So, so Machiavelli's advice was in some ways more about manipulating elites than it was about manipulating the people. Fascinating. Uh, there also was one more quote from Lerner, and I, I don't know, have you ever heard any background on, uh, did Mussolini really write an essay on Machiavelli and then ban his own book later? <laughs> yes, that's right. Mussolini did, was fascinated with, uh, with Machiavelli and then tried to disavow his own, uh, his, his own connection to Machiavelli. Why? Of course, was he trying to appear that he wasn't being manipulative? Ma or? Exactly, that he wasn't Machiavellian. Uh, <laughs> but we have, to, we have to remember the, the best uh, commentary on Machiavelli of that time was by Antonio Gramsci, uh, the great Italian communist who was imprisoned by Mussolini and wrote uh, a great book on the prince and basically uh, appropriated the prince or recognized that the prince was actually a, uh, a progressive book 
and and not a book of uh, oppression. Uh, just out of curiosity, the the uh, the prince is dedicated to the Medici, and I probably mispronounced that because I've got a metal block on it now. Uh, but did he take the advice that Machiavelli gave him? No, I, I mean Machiavelli <laughs> wrote wrote the book hoping that uh, Lorenzo de Medici would be impressed uh, by its content and then hire Machiavelli as a uh, as an advisor or as an, a secretary. But Machiavelli was too discredited. He was associated with the Republic that preceded the Medici and that tried to keep the Medici from coming back to power. And so Machiavelli was uh, very suspect in their eyes. He was considered much too uh, democratically inclined to, to be trustworthy. And he was implicated in a, um, uh, a coup against the Medici when they came back to power and he was tortured and imprisoned. And so he hoped that this book would rehabilitate him uh, with the Medici, but they never, they never did hire him in a political capacity. And, and one more fascinating piece of background to what time period we're looking at here. Uh, Columbus, 1492, and, and where are we when this book, uh, particularly The Prince, came out? Machiavelli writes The Prince in 1512 uh, and begins the discourses around the same time. So we're talking about, uh, yeah, only a decade or so uh, from from Columbus, but two two decades. Yeah. So the, these guys were really at a point in time where <laughs> one family, like the Medici's, could, <laughs> I'm mauling this guy's name. Uh, uh, they could kind of control the known world up till the point of hold it. The ball game changed. There's a whole new world out here. Did that have any effect, or did they have any idea that that sea change had happened yet? Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, the, the sea change for the Medici and for Italian city-states in general was that uh, nation-states had consolidated and now were uh, dominating the political landscape of Europe. And so when uh, the French invaded uh, Italy and came through uh, Florentine territory in 1494, and that just completely changed the view uh, that the Italians had of their political autonomy, their independence. Uh, they realized that Italy being divided among the papal states, republics in uh, Florence and Venice and the Duchy of Milan were just too small and too disorganized to actually hold up against uh, these monoliths like Spain and France at this point in time. So they felt they had lived in a period of uh, dramatic geopolitical revolution. But Machiavelli also kept in mind the scientific revolution and the exploratory uh, revolution you're talking about. I mean, he even affiliates himself with Columbus. He says that his, his new political doctrines put him on the level of someone who discovers new lands. Mm. So they, uh, basically we've got a, got a time period here where uh, the people with controlling interests seem to be trying to maintain control by stifling growth. Uh, that seems to be the kind of pattern that uh, Dr. Quigley, Carol Quigley in Tragedy and Hope is picking up. This is one of those time periods where we're about to see massive growth take off. Uh, you would also have seen inflation, according to Dr. Quigley, because the money supply, which at that point was still largely gold and silver precious metals, was greatly increased from the amount of gold and silver coming in from the New World. So we've got all of these different changes happening, and, and Machiavelli basically was aware of what was going on and was basically once again in favor of it. Well, no, actually, he thought that was a, a terrible temptation uh, in, a, in a certain way. He thought that, uh, you know, the Medici were becoming uh, exponentially more wealthy uh, during this era. And rather than, uh, and so they thought they could buy or protect their political power with money. So they increased Florence's dependence on mercenary arms, whereas Machiavelli said, you're you're under a complete illusion if you think money is the best defense. One's people are the best defense. The be Look at the Romans. The Romans eschewed monetary gain, but basically 
arm their citizens. Their common citizens were the backbone and the main defense of their of their liberty. And he thought the the Medici were instead of trying to uh, arm common citizens and defend Florence and perhaps even unite Italy, um, they were trying to buy the defense of Florence and of Italy. And he thought that would be a disaster. And of course, he was right. I mean, Italy wouldn't be unified you know, until 1870, centuries later, precisely because uh, Italy was too militarily disorganized and, and politically impoverished, basically. What did it do to the fortune of the, of, of the Medicis? Well, as a family, they did very well. I mean, they moved into financing the papacy and financing the, the French monarchy. Uh, so they went into international finance and as a family uh, became you know, incredibly wealthy. But Florence, as a, as a political power and a cultural center, declined. It, it, uh, it basically withered away. Fascinating. Uh, I guess that kind of really brings us into the... Uh, I was curious if you would... Uh, during the next 10 minutes, and I apologize that it's such a short amount of time. This is like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, but but what, would, uh, what do you feel that Machiavelli would be advising uh, today's version of the Medici monopoly capitalists? Uh, well, his, his advice would be uh, the, pursuit, the pursuit of profit, the pursuit of gain, uh, monetary gain, is, is nothing compared to the glory that you gain by serving your city civically or defending it militarily and that you're making a mistake if you think that accumulating arms rather than increasing the uh, accumulating wealth over your fellow citizens rather than empowering your fellow citizens rather than by initiating reforms that make common citizens more powerful that allow them to directly uh, rule over themselves the most the most famous people in history are uh, Romulus, Brutus, Scipio, uh, people who uh, benefited their city civically, improved their institutions by allowing people to participate in politics and gain liberty, expand their liberty, rather than those like Julius Caesar and the Medici, who, who basically used their wealth uh, to, to further uh, enslave in some way, make clients out of fellow citizens. And that's the wrong way to go. He would say be, being a plutocrat uh, is nothing in the long term, in the, in the view of history, is infinitesimally, infinitesimally small compared to being a statesman or being a civic leader or a refounder of one's republic. So, so he would say their, their priorities are completely wrong. If you want to be great, don't lord wealth over fellow citizens. Empower fellow citizens. When when I heard you interviewed you uh, earlier, uh, you absolutely hooked me when you reminded me what I should have known. Uh, and again, because uh, Machiavelli's kind of gotten this bad rap, uh, but but when you reminded me that that Machiavelli would have been basically opposed to the policies of Julius Caesar, that was a surprise that shouldn't have been a surprise. Can you kind of elaborate? Sure. I mean, he, there are strong uh, affiliations in Machiavelli's writings between Julius Caesar and the Medici. In other words, Machiavelli thought they had bought the favor of the people, uh, you know, just through, through gifts, by making clients uh, out of individual citizens, rather than by genuinely improving their lives. And so he thought that uh, Caesar, like the Medici, were, was a corrupting force in Rome, not a liberating force, not an empowering force for Rome. The, the real heroes of Rome are those who institute, uh, you know, he loved institutions in Rome that uh, allowed the people to more directly and collectively rule themselves. So he, he favored, Rome had these tribunes of the plebs. So these plebeian tribunes were officers that only, only lower class citizens could hold. And they had tremendous power, tremendous power of veto, uh, tremendous power to indict and try uh, wealthy and prominent citizens for crimes against uh, the republic. He thought this was a tremendous institution that nobody else in history likes because they're they don't like excluding the wealthiest and most powerful citizens from powerful offices. 
he loved uh, assemblies where everybody participated, where everybody, every citizen was allowed to speak, propose, and vote on legislation. And he thought that the uh, the statesmen who encouraged the initiation of those kinds of institutions were worthy of greatness, but that those who just bought off citizens, um, like Caesar, like the Medici, were a corrupting influence. The uh, in in discourses he specifically talks about the agrarian reforms as being what helped lead to the dissolution of the of the Roman Republic and the rise of Julius Caesar. Uh, the Occupy movement right now is trying to find a middle course of do we increase taxes on the rich and I guess you could say agrarian reforms that the Romans tried to do, that was a tax increase on the rich, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, he, he, he certainly thought that, that, that the crisis of the Roman Republic came as a crisis of inequality, that uh, he said the greatest republics have to, quote unquote, keep the public rich, but the citizens poor. And that means basically you have large public coffers that belong to everybody, but that individually people were relatively equal. And he, he thoroughly blamed the Roman Senate for block, you know, the Romans from the very beginning, uh, the Roman plebeians, the Roman poorer citizens had said all along, look, we fight for this republic. We go away from the city. And then we come home and our lands are foreclosed on. And like the wealthiest Romans are like foreclosing on our land and uh, using slaves to till it. And we're going into poverty. We, we need some reforms here. We need to have limits on how much land people can hold so that some don't accumulate so much more than others who have nothing. And from the very earliest days of the Republic, uh, the plebeians tried to legislate that. But the, um, the Roman elite uh, kept diverting uh, policy from uh, that actually coming into being, particularly by increasing empire. They would constantly say, oh, we can't deal with agrarian reform now. We have to fight another war. We have another enemy to conquer. And then they would uh, take the land conquered from that enemy, not distribute it to the plebeians and keep it for themselves, such that they exacerbated the very problem of inequality that the agrarian laws were supposed to solve. And so Machiavelli showed that uh, the Roman senators should have been wise enough early on to compromise, uh, allow some alleviation of the inequality between the wealthiest and poorest Romans, such that Rome would have a civic life. But, uh, but they didn't. Uh, they killed the primary reformers, uh, the brothers Gracchus, Tiberius Gracchus and Gaius Gracchus. Uh, they killed them for passing, uh, effectively, the agrarian legislation. And... This is what led to Caesarism, Machiavelli says. You know, all future reformers basically would, would not try to legislate the economic question. They would come with arms to force the Senate uh, to accept economic reform. And by that point, it was too late. The, the Roman citizens were too economically dependent on their generals uh, rather than on the city itself to, uh, to be capable of, of governing themselves. And so... So Machiavelli directly saw, uh, saw a direct correlation between uh, economic inequality in Rome and the collapse of the Roman Republic. Uh, the Discourses is, has, has an entire chapter of, of uh, dealing with the supremacy of law and, the, and the, why that's vital. Uh, can you help me out here on uh, what would have Machiavelli's advice on supremacy of law? Well, Machiavelli thought, <clears throat> you know, he was obviously a realist, and he thought that the freedom that republics afford individuals allow some individuals to acquire more wealth and more power than others, and that they will use that power to circumvent the law and to uh, basically take advantage of other citizens. And so he said a republic cannot stand unless it makes all citizens uh make all the laws applicable to all citizens and that no one was above the law. And that's why he thought that the, um, he really thought that publicly decided uh, political trials was the way to keep elites in line. He really thought that if you, if you just let other elites decide the fate of econo people who ec economically uh, despoil the republic or people who abuse their office 
that those people are going to get off and they're going to increasingly think that they're above the law. And so, you know, I, people often ask me, well, what would Machiavelli do in, you know, what would he have said about the last generation of American politics? And I, I, I can say straight faced that he would be shocked that a republic that calls itself a vibrant, uh, a vibrant democratic republic Given what he knew about Athens, given what he knew about Rome, he would have been shocked that uh, the people, the, the public officials responsible for Iraq II were never put on trial for wasting uh, lives and treasure needlessly, uh, and that um, those who, who proposed that, that war were not uh, put on trial for their lives for starting it so recklessly and so uh, irresponsibly. Also, uh, after the Wall Street crisis, he would have been shocked. A, a, a vibrant republic like Athens and Rome would have tried the major players in the banking failure uh, and, and put them on trial for, the, for their lives and have the entire citizenry uh, decide their fate. That, that That's the only way you keep elites in a in a polity that pretends to be free from uh, abusing their station in a republic. And so uh, he would have thought we were a terribly permissive, overly permissive uh, political culture that allowed people to waste lives uh, and waste the economic well-being of our country. I, I want to remind our listeners, uh, the people that are listening live right now, uh, that, that we can take questions for Dr. McCormick. Uh, don't know, do, it uh, doesn't look like we have any questions for him yet, but I'm hoping some of our audience listeners are kind of curious enough to come up with some questions for you. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to mess this word up. It's not a word I use every day. Calumnity? <laughs> Calumnies. Calumnies. Calumnity. It's uh, a hard word. A false ac- <laughs> let's call it a false accusation. Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> Let's call it a smear. It, it kind of sounds like what we're dealing with right now with propaganda. When the That's Occupy true. movement first started, uh, there were complete news blackouts. They have lied about the Occupy movement along with other things. Um, how did he recommend dealing with, with the lying and also with uh, oh, accusations? How, how, do you, how do you accuse the prince uh, and what happens if you accuse the prince falsely? Well, this is this was this is related to the previous question about the rule of law. I mean, Machiavelli also realized. I mean, he incredibly prescient, right? Uh, th- this is why he he speaks to us today. Yes. What 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 the elite do, you know? And he's more concerned with the few, what he calls the grandi, the great the automati, the aristocrats. He's, he's worried mo- the greatest political danger to liberty, according to Machiavelli, is the few, the wealthy few. Unlike Madison, who would identify the many as the main political problem, the main pr- political threat, Machiavelli thought the few were the, the main threat because they would collude and use their wealth uh, to basically increase their advantages within republics. And the main way they do that, their greatest danger to a republic is not that they uh, use their wealth to physically intimidate necessarily uh, opposition or potential reformers, but precisely that they smear uh, the opposition. So that Machiavelli gives us examples time and time again of uh, the oligarchs or the few, the wealthy, using their, their money to spread rumors. He himself was a victim of aristocratic smears in Florence. So he knew this uh, full well. And he knew how devastating it could be. He knew how corrosive it could be. And he knew how it eroded uh, transparency, you know, which is required for uh, a civic republic to, to, to actually be free. And so his answer was, you, we have to have an open system where any charge leveled against a citizen has to be aired and decided by a jury of many people so that, you know, you, you would have to, you would, you would say, is this, is this charge true? Who's going to make this charge? Who's going to come forward and stand behind this charge? And we're going to, we're going to have a group of at least 500 citizens uh, decide whether 
this is true or false based on whatever ev evidence you can now bring to bear behind this charge. And Machiavelli thought that was the effective way of bringing the truth into the light rather than just have rumor and counter rumor. And whoever has the most money is going to be able to generate the biggest rumors, right? Um, he, he really thought that every, every charge, every accusation needed to be publicly aired and decided by as many common citizens as possible as to its validity or falsehood. Uh, so, for instance, you know, President Obama's birth certificate, <laughs> he would have said, okay, who wants, to, who wants to stand up for this charge against the president? Who wants to publicly make this charge, present your evidence to a citizen jury of 500 people, and let them decide whether this is true or false? That would have been the answer. Rather than let that go on and on and on, that would have been his solution to that, to that calumny. And it had better be correct because you were going to go to prison if it wasn't. <laughs> That's, well, pref Machiavelli had a preference for death, so uh, <laughs> he had a pre he thought that uh, he thought capital punishment was the was the best uh, uh, the, the best punishment for political crimes because it it was the 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 best deterrent. I mean, he really thought that elites uh, could could be deterred by very little except the prospect of steel as he calls it. <laughs> and, and during this time period, that probably was much more merciful. Uh, and there's a scary thought. I do have a question here. Uh, was the fall of the Roman Empire anything to do with the reluctance to expand anymore? Or was this cease, cessation of expansion caused by economic means? No, I, I mean, according to Machiavelli's analysis, the, the fall of the Roman Republic is directly attributable to too much expansion. Uh, it's the expansion of the Republic that did two things. Uh, one, it further impoverished Roman citizen soldiers because they were spending years away from the city and becoming uh, dependent on their commanders rather than on the city itself for their well-being. And two, it overly empowered commanders because the Romans were uh, now increasing the, the duration of, office, uh, of offices for holding uh, commands and generalships such that, you know, when the Republic started out, no one could hold a military command for more than a year. By the time we get to uh, the Punic War against Carthage, uh, people are holding, holding offices for, for multiple years at a time. So Machiavelli thought empire was uh, the, it was, it was destructive of the civic culture of common Romans and it was corrupting of the elite culture of generals because it was making them uh, too enamored with their, with their uh, extended commands. So as far as Machiavelli was concerned, uh, empire is, is the cause uh, of the Roman Republic's demise. Interesting that the, the, the growth was so fast, in other words, that the political structure wasn't capable to keep up with it. We've got about two minutes left. Uh, Mark Lahr, did you want to throw something in here? Uh, actually, yeah, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, first of all, I was wondering, uh, I've, I've read a certain line of thought that uh, when Machiavelli wrote The Prince, that uh, he, he was that it was not only uh, simply advice to the prince, but uh, perhaps a somewhat veiled uh, attempt to uh, expose the uh, the nature and methods of princely power to the uh, uh, to the more common person. Do you think there might be any truth in that? Uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that, and there's a it's a it's a great question. You're in good company uh, there, Mark Lahr, because I, I mean I think it's it's figures none other than uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Baruch Spinoza who thought that about Machiavelli's writing, that there was something edifying. I mean, don't forget mm -hmm. Machiavelli's writing in the vernacular, right? He's writing in, he's not writing in Latin, he's writing in vernacular Tuscan uh, in the context of an incredibly literate population. Uh, so there's, there's more than a little truth to that, that, that this is uh, edifying for uh, right. the average Probably person. Probably a bit politically safer than uh, coming right out and saying it. Uh, uh, so, something like songs in the fifties, where uh, they <laughs> talked about sex, but they couldn't really, uh, you know, say it outright, right? <laughs> I, think that's, that's, I, I think it's it's not an accident that his two greatest works, "The Prince Is Dedicated to a Prince," 
and the discourses are dedicated to aristocrats, uh, but both books are really for the people. He never dedicated a book to the people, but I would say that both books are actually written right. for the people. Okay, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, the uh, the other question I had, uh, actually, uh, less of a question uh, rather than I'd uh, I'd really like to hear you uh, just uh, expand a little bit on uh, some of. Uh, uh, I had actually uh, come up with this question yesterday because I had read the uh, uh, Amazon.com uh, description of your book, uh, Machiavellian Democracy. And I uh, mentioned in there that uh, part of what's in the book is uh, uh, an advocacy for uh, an institution where people are actually chosen, the average citizens are chosen by lottery, and of course you've touched on this idea a little bit, uh, who would have veto power over certain things and the ability to uh, uh, go after the malfeasance of uh, those in power. And th this is something that uh, I have absolutely uh, ha had the idea of for, for decades and in recent years, the last three or four years, I, I keep uh, every now and then seeing uh, where other people have sort of the same kind of idea, although I, I personally never knew about this uh, system in Rome you were talking about. Uh, it seems like a very good idea. I was hoping you could expand uh, your thoughts on that. Well, sure. Well, and thank you for the plug, Maclar. Uh, the, the, the book, the book is Machiavellian Democracy, Cambridge University Press. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, Machiavelli allowed me to go back to these other, these older republics or older democracies, and just see how different ours is from theirs. I mean, for instance, it's it's amazing that in Athens, most political offices were distributed by lottery. If you wanted to hold an office, you put your name forward. And you had as much chance as any wealthy person who put their name forward to be chosen out, out you know, at random to hold that office. And, and they considered lottery the democratic way of distributing offices. They thought election was aristocratic because the guy with the most money always wins elections. Surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> so, so randomization was always – randomization among a wide body of citizens for distributing offices was considered by – Greek democracies to be the only way to, to, to rule democratically. Uh, in Rome, Machiavelli thought, okay, the Romans don't have a uh, lottery to distribute offices, but they preserve this one very important office uh, for common citizens. If you're one of the wealthiest Romans, you can't be a, 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 a tribune of the plebs. And this tribune of the plebs has amazing powers. You get to veto any law uh, proposed by the Senate or, or proposed by a consul, the chief magistrates, you get to indict before all the citizens anybody, any individual for abusing their office or even a private citizen for indicting, uh, 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 for corrupting the republic. And you conduct these assemblies where the patricians or the wealthiest citizens are excluded such that average Romans can actually propose and discuss law without the influence of wealthy citizens. So it seems to me, you know, I think we think it's a new idea that we have to diminish the influence of wealthy and powerful citizens over common citizens in the political process, whereas it's an incredibly old idea. In fact, right. in fact citizens of Athens and Rome thought that was the major, the, the major task of preserving political liberty. Yeah, that's 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 very intriguing that uh, that they were doing that. Um, I think. Uh, what, what would you think uh, would be the best way to uh, sort of implement such an idea in uh, in our, into our own political system? Uh, would it be as uh, perhaps as a, a a new branch of government? Well, that's what I propose. But really, as a, as a thought experiment, I mean, the chances of getting a new branch of government implemented are you know as likely as. My fly, right, but, yeah. but but we 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 certainly, I mean, I mean certainly, we have to limit uh, the influence of of money on electoral politics. That has to be that's the the first thing. Yeah, but the certainly. second, but the second thing, more radically, I mean, at at local levels, at the at the state and municipal level, we really should be experimenting with with lottery for distributing offices. Um, we we should really think about. Uh, having 
having offices that are open to, to anybody who wants to hold office, you know, and not just those who have the money to run for office themselves or are beholden to those who will uh, pay for their campaigns. Uh, we would really have, I think, a much more vibrant, a much more uh, diverse, uh, 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 a politics much more reflective of more people if we, if we had political lotteries. Uh, I also think I, I, I have been quite seduced by Machiavelli on this idea of popularly judged political trials. I, I, I do think that uh, uh, there's, there's something very, very important about allowing the people themselves to judge the legality and or criminality of the behavior of our, our wealthy and particularly our uh, public officials. Uh, because I think, um, as Machiavelli noted, I mean, one of my favorite lines from the discourses is, the few always behave in the mode of the few. And he, he uses that line in particular uh, when it comes to small committees of fellow elites judging uh, the political behavior of other el elites. And they always collude or they co-opt each other or they corrupt each other. And, and you never get a um, – you don't get a fair or objectively just outcome. Uh, and, and therefore, you don't deter future malfeasance. And I think uh, one of Machiavelli's strongest recommendations for a democracy was certainly these publicly judged political trials. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right on that. Uh, I think most people would agree with that. Uh, all you have to do is uh, really is, is to look at all the cases where, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, Agency is investigating itself. Uh, you know, the <laughs> yeah. police are investigating. You know, police misconduct. You know, things like that, and and it seems pretty apparent. Yeah, it's. I mean, and that was that was uh, Florence for Machiavelli, where everybody's fam Everybody had a family member in some committee that was investigating the family member, and it was completely uh, completely corrupt. There was no way to get an objective uh, outcome in any of these systems because everyone was beholden to each other or, or someone had something over somebody else. And uh, the only way to, to get to the bottom of these things, Machiavelli said, is to have uh, deciding bodies of what he said were very many judges. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as you indicated before, it's not really easy to do. I know uh, here in Seattle, we, we actually have a, uh, a police accountability board which is supposed to be a citizen's board to investigate uh, problems with the police. And uh, as, soon as, as soon as we managed to get it into existence, uh, it was filled with, uh, I believe there's 12 people on the board, and uh, 10 of those 12 are all ex-law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So even, yeah. When you, even when you make some progress, it can be really tough to... Uh, to get it done correctly, you know. <laughs> that's that's a that's a great example. I mean, that oh. that's precisely what you don't want. I mean, he wanted citizen bodies or citizen boards because he wanted uh, to increase the chance of having people with with no agenda uh, on the issue at hand to be the ones to decide it, not those who who actually are invested in it. Right. We've got a question that came in. Uh, what do you, what do you feel, Machiavelli? <laughs> his position would have been on the TSA. Uh, about the, uh, the, the security? Uh, yeah, and, and, and the invasive, uh, the losses of our liberties that are becoming more and more commonplace every day. Would he have, had a, would he have addressed that, do you feel? Well, he, he talks a lot about upholding the civic way of life or the, what he called the free way of life. Um, He's not so specific on what that means. I mean, it's an easier case. Well, it's a hard case. It's been hard for me to make the case that Machiavelli is a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> but I, th I think I've made that. But to make him a liberal is a really hard case, uh, <laughs> just, just by my remarks here today. I mean, Machiavelli liked his politics rough. Uh, and um, individual rights, particularly of elite citizens, he was pretty indifferent to. Um, because... He thought they had so many advantages that it was basically uh, the cost of doing business to run the risk of 
losing your individual liberty or even life if you were enjoying so much disproportionately as the rest of the public. But as far as individual citizens uh, and, and invasive things like that, I mean, Machiavelli, the freedom he's most committed to is, is free speech in assemblies. And so uh, in, in, the, in the sense that that's not something the TSA has necessarily interfered with, uh, I, I don't know. But that, that's, that's less, I mean, he certainly, there are other problems related to post 9-11 America that I think Machiavelli would have been more upset about, uh, in particular, unnecessary wars, uh, using unnecessary wars to divert from domestic reforms at home was a problem he identified in Rome that I think we can say is is pretty characteristic of post nine eleven America, uh, and that would have been something that uh, that he would have criticized, um, and also uh, allowing allowing the oligarchs to despoil uh, the system to enrich themselves disproportionately while. Uh, Common citizens are increasingly impoverished, while the wealthier become w even more wealthy, and thereby use that wealth to, to corrupt the political system. That's that. Those are the developments of post nine eleven America that I think really uh, Machiavelli would have criticized. Fascinating. Uh, we've gone over our thirty minutes, uh, <laughs> but we're not a commercial broadcast, so I guess we'll live through that. We'll just take a <laughs> we'll just take a small slap on the wrist. Uh, I did want to kind of touch base once again, remind our listening audience there is a link now to uh, Dr. McCormick's book Machiavellian Democracy, available through Amazon. Uh, we are still taking questions here. This will probably be the last one we take, though, if anybody's got another question. And I did want to kind of round out with one last thought. Um, if if uh, Machiavelli could give the Occupy movement any advice, uh, was there ever an oligarchy that uh, needed to change policy that he would have given advice on how do you change that policy? Mm. He would have said... Machiavelli would have said that elites do never change out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, they never listen to reason, uh, and they certainly are not swayed by moral uh, moral persuasion. Uh, he would have said that ancient citizens, citizens of ancient republics like Athens and Rome, extracted political concessions out of the elites by uh, withholding uh, the one power they had, which was their military force, that basically they said, if you if you don't give us political reforms that increase our liberty and increase the equality of this republic, we're not going to fight for it. We're going to withhold our our uh, our collective military power. And he would have not been surprised that in the 19th and early 20th century, that the only way uh, the oligarchs of the North Atlantic republics uh, made concessions to the common people was when the common people withheld or threatened to withhold their labor power from the economy. And so I would say that the Occupy movement needs to find a way, uh, needs to find that material, that substance that they can organize around and threaten to withhold from contemporary elites to extract concessions from them. And that may mean, I mean, we know how much labor power has declined over the last half century. Uh, but it, that may mean uh, a firmer alliance between Occupy and labor uh, and perhaps reaching out to international uh, uh, solidarity uh, with other organizations to try to find what, what is it that we can threaten to hold back from contemporary elites to make them uh, hear uh, and respond to uh, the need for a more uh, democratic uh, country and countries around around the world. So I I, uh, I don't have an answer there. I don't know if it's consumer power, if it's the power of consuming. It seems to be labor, however weakened, is still the best option on the table. And I I would hope that uh, Occupy and and labor. Uh, continue to form closer bonds 
and to organize and to uh, threaten strikes and uh, and other withholdings because just demonstration uh, doesn't even admirable peaceful and and occupy should be should never be uh, we should never hold back our commendation for uh, the way occupy has conducted itself uh, across cities in this country but I think you know those are of limited effect Machiavelli would say uh, we have to find a way to uh, extort concessions out of the elite Dr. McCormick You've left us with a lot to think about. Uh, again, a half an hour <laughs> just isn't enough time, obviously, since we didn't manage to keep within our half an hour. And I don't feel bad about that today. <laughs> I really, really would lo love to have you come back. I'm sure there's a lot more uh, in this well that needs to be addressed. Uh, oh, well, thank you. I, again, uh, there is gonna, there's a link to your book. Absolutely fascinating book, which I've managed to get through a couple of pages because I only got hold of it at 11 o'clock this morning. Um, I, I strongly recommend read this book. I'll guarantee you I'm going to be reading this book. Uh, any last thoughts, uh, Mark Clark? Uh, we're about to round her out uh, here. No, just, uh, yeah, the book does sound fascinating, actually. Uh, I, I would love to read it sometime. I'm you broke to everybody at the moment, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll send you a copy. Mark, 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 I'll be happy to send you a that copy. would be awesome. Yeah, send me uh, an email. I'm happy to send you a copy. Oh, that'd be great. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I can uh, get that for Terry after we wrap up here. But uh, well, uh, uh, I'd just like to thank you uh, once again for coming on for myself. And uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's been uh, it's been a fascinating uh, talk and. I, uh, I'd love to have you back uh, with us as well sometime. It would be a, a pleasure for me. Thank you. We'll hold you to that, Doc. Uh, Got to get our plugs in. We want to thank, uh, thank our engineering. Uh, once again, Brattery, you've done a sweet job once again. That's brattery.com. Uh, we want to thank our, uh, our co-occupier radio talent. Tara, uh, and, and I believe we're going to be running her show archive version uh, along with this show. There will be a link to it because sometimes the music is the message. Um, for right now, I think that's about all we've got time for. Once again, thanks to Dr. John McCormick, University of Chicago, and uh, Occupy Radio is going to have to be on the air next week. Uh, thanks again. Thanks for listening. Good night.